One of the most powerful visualizations you can create in math and physics is a surface plot. In a surface plot, you're trying to show what a function looks like in multiple dimensions. So for example, in this function, we've got a, a variable along the x direction, a variable along the y direction, and along the z direction here uh, is showing us the value of the function. This particular function is a Gaussian, e to the negative x squared minus y squared. Uh, and surface plots allow you to visualize these things in a couple of ways. First of all, there's the actual contour of the function where I can see at any point which points are higher, which points are lower, where am I headed toward a max, where am I headed toward a min. But another cool thing you can do with these is the coloration. So even if you're looking at it from overhead like this, I can see where the extreme high values are and where the extreme low values are in the graph. And since in physics, you're often working with functions of multiple variables, this is a useful tool for visualizing these functions. And it's actually pretty straightforward to create such a visualization in GlowScript v Python if you use the triangle function. We've taken a look at triangles before, just very basic, so I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Uh, but to actually utilize their full power, it's helpful to create these extended objects out of these triangular mini surfaces. So the way I've done this in this code is to set up a function to plot. That's literally what we're setting up here is defining a function to plot. It's a function of x and y. We're going to start out with this Gaussian function e to the negative x squared plus y squared. So you notice it's symmetric across x and y, so you could write this in polar coordinates if you wanted to as e to the negative r squared. Uh, that would work. And we're going to return that function here. We'll try out some other functions later, but I just want to walk you through how this works. Then you're going to set your range for graphing. So when you make a two-dimensional graph, uh, you just specify the X range, right? And then the Y range just kind of auto scales based on the function or the data that you're looking at. But in this case, we need a range for X and a range for Y. It usually makes sense to have those ranges be the same. So you could just have Y min and Y max default to X min and X max if you wanted to, but you can also set them up differently. Maybe you want a squished uh, viewing window or something like that. Then we're gonna set up DX. DX is the grid size. So it's the amount of space between the individual points we are looking at, right? Whenever you make a graph, you're not graphing every infinitesimal point in space. You're picking points that are a space DX apart. And in this case, we're looking at a space DX in the X direction and DX in the Y direction. Again, in principle, you could make this different for X and Y. You almost always can get away with just having them be the same. So the next step is to set up our grid where we are actually looking at discrete points in space where we are evaluating this function. And we're going to keep track of that in a list. So this is called list of vertices because it's going to be the list that has all the vertices. Uh, and we're going to set that up with a couple of loops here. So you notice I've got a for loop here and a for loop here. Anytime you're working in multiple dimensions, you're going to have multiple nested loops. So I have a loop over X and a loop over y. I have to do both because I have to visit all the points along the x-axis and all the points along the y-axis. And the best way to do that is just go line by line like you're reading sentences on a page. So we calculate the value of the function there. So we're taking z equals the function to plot at x comma y. We're also keeping track of which value of z is the maximum. That's going to become important later. Just know that z max represents the highest point we have anywhere on this graph. So my list of vertices is actually going to be a list of lists. So first I'm setting up a, a temporary list here that will hold the vertices that all have this same x value. So you can think of this as being all of the dots uh, along this particular value of x. And so we're setting up the position for the vertex there. X and Y are being automatically generated by the loop. So that's systematically visiting each one of those points. And Z is being generated by the function that we defined earlier. Uh, they're each going to get a color. We're going to default to color.red just for now. We're going to modify that later after we get our Z max information. And then here we have pinned that temporary list to the list of vertices. So this list of vertices is going to have two addresses, right? It's going to have one index to tell me where I am in the X direction and one index to tell me where I am in the Y direction. If you've had linear algebra, this is the same as specifying row and column in a matrix. It's just a two dimensional address. It's how many are you over to the right? How many are you uh, up and down? Uh, then what we're going to do, we're going to loop over all of those points. So all of the 
uh, points have an IX address and an IY address. We're going to loop over all those values to visit every single vertex. And we're going to rescale their color based on the Z value. So list of vertices, IX, IY, that's a single vertex. That's one vertex. We're looking at that one vertex's Z position and we're rescaling that by Z max. So think of this as a percentage. So if this is the absolute highest point in the graph, then this is gonna be a one. If this is gonna be the lowest point in the graph, then it's gonna be very close to zero. Uh, or it'll be negative. I haven't tried out negative yet. That might be interesting to see what happens with negative values. Uh, over here, we're gonna have uh, just one minus red. So blue is gonna max out wherever red is at a minimum and vice versa. And right now we're gonna leave green as zero. I might turn that on later. Uh, it's sufficient to have just these two because we just need something to scale between for the height. And so here we modified that vertex's color based on the calculated values of red, green, and blue that we evaluated here. Now comes the fun part. So if you just run the code there, you won't see anything because a vertex doesn't actually show you anything in the animation window. What you're seeing in the 3D animation window is the actual triangles that we are creating. You can see their little patchwork corners uh, over here. But the way these triangles work is that you specify a list of vertices, right? A triangle has three vertices, it needs three points, and each of those points has an address, x, y, z coordinates, and a color. And so what we do for each triangle, we're gonna give the current vertex, so this is the point I'm looking at right now, i, x, i, y, and then we're gonna move to that vertex's four adjacent neighbors. And if you're a vertex, on a square grid like this, you're gonna have a neighbor to the left, you're gonna have a neighbor to the right, you're gonna have a neighbor above you, you're gonna have a neighbor below you. That's what we're accessing here. IX plus one takes me to the neighbor to the right. IX minus one takes me to the neighbor to the left. IY plus one takes me to the neighbor above. IY minus one takes me to the neighbor below. So I can get all of those neighbors here just by putting in every possible combination because I want to be able to form all of those possible triangles, right? If I'm at this point and there are four points around me, that's four triangles that I can fulfill there. And so you'll have the center point in each one of these triangles, and then you'll have the point to the right and the point above. You'll have the point to the left and the point above. You'll have the point to the right and the point below, and you'll have the point to the left and the point below. So we're getting all four combinations, all four of those possible triangles that are surrounding that central point that we're at right now. And since each of those vertices has its own color, the triangle function blends those colors in between so that you get this nice smooth coloration here. Uh, the graph itself is actually also pretty smooth. We made a DX of 0 0.1. If you make that DX bigger, you're gonna get a much rougher looking curve here, right? So for example, this, uh, I see a lot of uh, corners there because I've made the size, the, the step size much too big. Basically, the smaller you make this DX, the smoother that graph is going to look. Also, the longer it will take to render uh, because it's having to perform more calculations there. So I think we were all right with a step size of 0 0.1. And you can also change the uh, range here. Let's say I wanna move this range out to, neg to two in each direction. So we'll have a four by four uh, grid there. And here I can really see that Gaussian, Gaussian shape where I get a maximum here that quickly drops off. And the rest is basically flat, right? The rest, there, there isn't too much else to the, uh, to the flat region there. And now I had an issue where I might not like having negative values here. So let's see what we get here. Okay, yeah, yeah. So negative turns everything red there. We don't want to have that. So I need to rethink how I did that here. I suppose what I also need to keep track of is the Z minimum value. So you can keep track of a minimum the same way you keep track of a maximum. You just set the answer to be very large so that you pick up the smallest value easily. So we're gonna look for the min. Awesome. And so I think what I want to do here is subtract off Z minimum. That way if it is a if this is a negative value, it will become even uh, bigger. And I want to have Z max minus Z min in the new in the denominator there. And I think for blue, 
Let's see, I think I can still leave that as one minus red because this is gonna be a fraction. This is gonna max out at one still. Let's see if that fixes my problem. Okay, yes, that fixed my problem. Excellent, excellent. I get a red on the max and a blue on the min. Uh, let's make sure that comes out correctly here. Always excited when I get to fix code live on on the video. Yeah, okay, so that's looking really good. Like, so let's say maybe you have two exponentials, right? Maybe you have one, uh, one Gaussian that's centered around, uh, let, let's put it at one and one. And now let's suppose you take the negative and put a Gaussian at uh, negative one and one. Or negative one, negative one. There we go. That way they'll be at opposite corners, right? So now I'll have a Gaussian at one, one, and a Gaussian at negative one, negative one. And one of them will point up, one of them will point down. Look at that. Really cool stuff. So now that you have this machinery in place, uh, you can just play around with this, put whatever function you want there, and you're able to get out this really cool uh, 3D graph of it. Let's try a different one. Let's try some trig functions. Let's try sine of x times sine of y. This one's pretty fun because you get this saddle point in the middle, right? So if you're in Calc 3, you're learning about uh, these saddle points uh, where you're going, you have a, 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 a concave up going this way, but a concave down going this way. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's kind of hard to see that as a sign. I need to branch out the range a little bit. Let's take this uh, four in each direction so that we'll capture pi. Oh, very cool stuff. There's sine times sine, and that you can just imagine this is extending everywhere because sine keeps going off the same in every direction. That's pretty cool. Uh, of course, you could combine uh, exponential and trig functions. Maybe you want to have e to the negative uh, x squared plus y squared times cosine x times cosine y, right? So you get a, a trig function with an exponentially decreasing amplitude. Uh, that primarily gives me the exponential there. Okay, uh, let's make this a little bit broader. Uh, so let's try this times uh, 0 0.01 maybe. I think that'll broaden that out. There we go. I can see a little bit of a decrease there. All right, let's split the difference. Make that a tenth. I want to be able to see the amplitude decrease. Oh, yeah, there we go. So maybe you're doing a, a, a double slit experiment or something, and you want to have, you know, your, your, your main peak here and then your smaller peaks off to the side. Pretty cool stuff. So I hope you have some fun with this. Again, you can change this function to be literally anything you want in three dimensions. Uh, you can change these bounds to capture all the interesting behavior and the triangles here will show you what the interesting stuff looks like. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.